My name is Maria Grinevich. I am an editor in chief of Ukrainian media agency Sotsportal. I have talked to different German politicians, active and former, about the war in Ukraine, about German help to Ukraine, and about the welcoming of Ukrainian displaced persons in Germany. This video will be interesting to those who want to know more about these topics and especially to those who want to know how Ukrainians now live in Germany. My name is Ulrich Horning, I'm the Deputy Mayor for General Services here in the city of Leipzig. And on behalf of the Mayor and the City Council, I lead the Ukraine Task Force uh, for the city starting in early March. So, um, what was the first impression when we knew about this terrible war starting? And uh, it was a state of shock. It was a state of, um, of disbelief. Um, also a feeling of, I'd say, a feeling of shame. How we, as a country, have probably not recognized in an appropriate manner the threat from Russia and how we have not responded in a, in a, in a correct way to um, the warnings that were put out by intelligence, by, um, by, the, by the USA, but also by other powers um, of a new war um, against, against Ukraine and taken into the, the fact that this war started in 2014 and that we as Western Europe have glossed over this war since 2014. We have happily um, celebrated a World Cup in Russia in, what was it, 2016 or so? Um, and many, many other things that are not in the domain of the city of Leipzig. So it's not for me to decide as a deputy mayor of the, of the, of the city of Leipzig, but um, it certainly was also a shock to us because of the special relationship that we as the, the city of Leipzig hold to our, our partner city, Kiev. Uh, the oldest and longest standing re um, relationship that we as Leipzig have to any other city in Europe. And uh, when the refugees started to come, was Leipzig prepared to this flow of people or not? Um, Germany has had in 20 years, 2015 and 16, has had a an experience of a strong flow of refugees coming, but uh, of refugees coming over a longer period of time. Um, on the other hand, many of the refugees that came in 2015 and 16 were not from a European culture. So that led to, I'd say, difficult perceptions in the majority of the population or in a part of the population. Uh, we now had a completely different um, approach here. And, but I must honestly say, the question, and I, and I repeat this to my staff, I, I repeat this to my people here, dealing, helping with people coming from Ukraine, fleeing this war, is our basic duty. As it is our basic duty to help people fleeing a war in Syria, or fleeing a war in Libya, or fleeing a war in Africa. That is our basic humanitarian duty. And so let's not brag about it. Let's not be grand about it. Let's not you know, sort of aggrandize what we do here. What we do is the basics. What is really important is the struggle of the people of Ukraine against this aggression. What is really important is this war. Is this war, which is a war that your country is fighting for Europe against a fascist power. And I believe this is what we need to keep telling the population here, but also our staff that help with you know, helping refugees, um, that the true priority is in Ukraine and not whatever we do here. So, yeah. and, so, yeah. and uh, do you have approximate numbers of uh, people who, came, who, came, who come to Leipzig, to Ukraine? The approximate number of people in Leipzig is about um, a, registered, a registered refugee is about 8,000 since 24th of February. Uh, we have now transitioned about 7,000 of, of this number 
into um, a new uh, social protection regime, which gives them higher benefits, um, 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 health insurance, and the right to, to language courses and to labor market integration. The good thing from the very first day, or not the very first day, but very early on, was that the European Union triggered a mass arrival mechanism that, that basically placed any uh, person from Ukraine into a very privileged refugee status. Being allowed to work from the very first day, um, and needing very low levels of proof and, and, and requirement, and also what we had to do with a population that was willing to help, that was willing to, to do everything they needed to do to do all the, form, to do all the form, formalities. What was terrible for us that many of the Ukrainians came with the expectation that they come to a modern country, but in fact they come to a paper-based bureaucracy. So we've, and we've flooded them with loads of paper, and, but we're now trying on some of the things that we do in the next steps. Uh, we're piloting some, some new digital applications and new digital tools, and we find that 99% of our Ukrainian guests gladly embrace those digital tools, so we'll be using that experience uh, towards our German population and telling, you see, digital does not hurt. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, my very last question is, um, do you perceive this flow of refugee now as a crisis, or is it controlled, like, you know, on the German level, on the level of Leipzig? I don't perceive it as a crisis. I would say that the majority of Germans does not perceive it as a crisis. The majority of Germans perceives it as our duty to do whatever we can. Uh, what I find more worrying is the uh, position of our national government uh, towards providing military assistance to Ukraine. Um, I think that is more of a crisis than the fact that uh, we are now having a lot of uh, refugees. In fact, what we've experienced, and, and if you look at the, at the 9,000, maybe let's say there are 8,000, because many people go back to Ukraine now, they, or they go to a different European country, or they go to a relative in France or in the Netherlands, or they. So people are free to move. That's a very important thing. People are free to move, and where our stays is very welcome in Leipzig, and we provide the appropriate schools, we, pro we provide the, the appropriate kindergartens, of course, with a lot of trouble, you know. Uh, but and we and we're not able to provide an apartment to everyone. You know what we've been seeing is that there is a an outflow of help, of helping, and that, that three quarters of all these refugees are housed in private homes. And they're, they're, they're not in a, in a tent city or so. But we must say that now probably the limit of that has been reached, and also many private hosts are now saying, I've been, I've been willing to help for a few weeks, now we're coming to the fourth month, so I live in a small apartment, I might, might not be able to help further. So that those are some difficult questions we have to address, and we will provide shelter to everyone. But that shelter might not be an apartment; it might be communal housing, it might be a refugee facility, or we'll look for other cities in Germany, smaller cities in the countryside. Many of them offer to provide for refugees. They have free apartments. They have places in schools. They have great sports associations where the kids can arrive and so uh, that's what we try to sort of also help and incite people to go to smaller places where the, the housing markets are less stressed. My name is Jan van Aken. I'm a German citizen. I was a member of parliament here in Germany for eight years for the left party and now I'm working for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation which is a left uh, think tank here in Germany working on conflict and conflict analysis. Uh, how do you feel when uh, you learn that Russia invaded Ukraine? I still remember that moment because um, in the weeks beforehand I was traveling all around Germany to, to have debates, discussions around the, the possible yeah, possible Russian aggression. And uh, when it happened, I, I expected something to happen, but not that what we saw on the, on the, on the 24th of February. 
I was really shocked because I expected some violence, maybe an invasion of Don Donbass and, and Luhansk, and but not this um, yeah full scale war on all areas of Ukraine. So I was deeply shocked and was in, in, in the first minute I thought, so, oh fuck, what are we going to do now to stop Russia? And uh, now Germany faces a. Uh a lot of Ukrainian refugees come in. How do you assess the reaction of ordinary Germans and uh, of German authorities and their efforts to welcome Ukrainians? Mm. So from what I see, what I hear from friends, uh, many of my friends had Ukrainians at home uh, for a while or until today. And what I see, even in the conservative and, and yellow press, um, it was a very warm welcome. I mean, you could really see the difference between um, the, the refugees coming from Ukraine today as compared to Syrian or Afghan refugees in the years before, where there was always a lot of racism and, and anti-migrant um, 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 feelings. But but this time was totally different. So I think from what I see, um, it was a very positive response. But I think you better ask these questions to the Ukrainian women and families who came here. Maybe they had a different experience. And what about the German authorities? I mean, it was a full-blown welcoming of of um, um, all Ukrainian refugees here. I think it was really also from the authorities, from the government. It was a rather warm welcome. They organized it. Uh, I'm right now here in Berlin, and most of the refugees from from Ukraine they 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 arrived in Berlin. So it was every day tens of thousands, and I think the the city of Berlin did a perfect job in trying to make the the the, the arrival here as smooth and good as possible. Mm. Don't you think that now, after uh, more than two, like more than a uh, hundred days of war, the public opinion is uh, changing according, like toward the war? Um, so far, I don't see it. I think everybody's fearing it, but no, so far I don't see it. So um, um, a good indicator is always the yellow press, and and the yellow press is still very much in favor of solidarity with the Ukrainian people. So, um, and what I'm hearing, I, I think the response is still the same. It's not fading away, but as many others here, I'm afraid it might happen in, in the near future. What was your first feeling when you knew about the war in Ukraine? So the the one thing, for, so what was exceptionally, I think for me as a German, I was prepared. So I had, I think the day before or two days before, I had some talks with my friend Natalia Gumilyuk and some others, and I had... Um, my clock prepared. <laughs> so I woke up at 5 a.m. Um, Kiev time and I immediately knew what happened. And so after I had heard the speech by Vladimir Putin, I was also already convinced so that something terrible would happen. Uh, but um, then it was, I have to admit, even more terrible than I, I had expected. Did you think some, something like that could happen, for example, a year before? I followed this um, amassing of troops by Russia uh, along the borders of Ukraine, and I, from the very beginning, thought that this is serious. <laughs> What do you think about the... Um, efforts of German government in, uh, in this war. Is it enough? Or I'm, I'm totally disappointed. So when I read some days ago that for the last nine weeks, so for the longest part of the war, we have delivered no weapons from Germany to Ukraine. I, I was speechless, I, so I had no words. Because we had this tough battle, whether we deliver weapons or not, it was decided, even with a majority in the parliament, and then we deliver nothing. And so this is... Um, how do, how do, do they explain it? So Germans um, make it very complicated um, to... Um, 
so they, they obviously fear to be seen as part of the war. Yeah. Um, and it's in this government also a problem that the chancellor <laughs> says something, but then takes not the responsibility that this happens. So this makes our... Um, how can Ukrainians trust in Germans with all the stories which happened before? So it's, uh, there's a long legacy of um, German strategies in Eastern Europe, which were always focused on, uh, on Russia and, um, and Moscow and cheap energy, and um, gave the other nations in the regions always the second or third place. That's the quite general issue. And then, so look at the Minsk agreements. Um, it's um, quite typical that the Germans took the lead uh, to, um, to make an agreement which allowed Putin to be labeled as not a party to this war. So the whole story, which is now the narrative, uh, so against the, the, the aggression of Russia um, has the reason, yeah, if you follow Putin and Lavrov and others, to terminate Nazis uh, in Ukraine. Um, because they have to protect Russian-speaking people. And this narrative, so that there is a civil war going on and that Ukrainians are not um, accepting Russians and Russians need protection. This narrative is in the core of the Minsk agreements because the Minsk agreements made this uh, attack a civil war. And Russia was not responsible. Putin was not responsible. Not a party in the war.